All right. This is the uh, Jordan Con Watt Talk. I'm sitting here with the Wheel of Time spoilers, guys. I'm sure you're aware of their work. As I've learned here at Jordan Con, they have a very established fan base that overlaps with mine significantly. Hey. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. Um, and today we're going to be talking about our Jordan Con experiences and what have you. Fill in the blank afterward. And I was going to start off by saying if you guys enjoy Jordan Con so far, obviously your answer will be yes, but let's <laughs> <laughs> fill in why. Uh, I'll let you know when I'm less hungover. Uh, uh, or when I'm PM. drunk. There we go. There's oh, a, there's yeah, a ebb and flow. There, there's, there's about a half an hour between hungover and drunk. It's where called I drinking. Feel normal. Oh, that, is that what I'm doing right now? Yes. No. Oh, what are we drinking? Uh, I'm drinking uh, Laphroaig Le- Le- 10-year, which I was pleased to see they have at the bar this year. Yeah. It was a nice, nice super peaty scotch. I know it's not for everyone. Yeah. Seth hates it. I, you know, I don't <laughs> hate it. I actually enjoy peaty scotch. I just think it's hilarious that I can smell it when you bought it from 10 feet away. Like, when you <laughs> walk up, the bottle opens, as soon as the bottle like... opens, the whole restaurant smells like peat. And, like, I'm just like, you're having Laphroaig, I know it. You know, like, <laughs> and I would have it, too. I enjoy it, but I'm not a bait. I don't drink the... Okay. As much. I'm more of a beer drinker, and I'm drinking. Hold on, I threw the bottle away. <laughs> so, that's how we feel about Jordan Con. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, Lug Trid Ale. Okay. And that was given to us by uh, one of our fans. Um, you walk in, and you may only know people from the internet, or you may not know anyone at all, but people are just so... Um, how can I say this? Kind, accepting... Empathetic. Well, the perfect way to put it, I haven't seen anyone awkwardly sitting in the corner on their phone not having a good time. Yeah. Everyone is with people having fun. It's it's the welcoming of just, come here. Like, you know I mean? Yeah. It's, it's yeah, remarkable in that walk sense. up to a group and say, hey, guys, it's my first year. What do I do? And they'll be like, we'll show you. It's, yeah. yeah. It's really like that. It sounds like a fairy tale, but it's true. I didn't know anyone arriving here aside from, like, you know, talking online, doing collaborations. Except and all stuff. the people who come up to you and said, I love what you do. Well, I didn't know them, <laughs> and now I'm getting to know them. A really incredible meeting people and just having great conversations about Wheel of Time. Everyone here is so informed and so yes. good at what they do. Um, there's, It's funny, I, I have yet to meet anyone who isn't doing any gatekeeping at all either. There's none of that, oh, you haven't read it, because there's people here who haven't finished the series, and they're incredibly welcome. It's, oh, what book are you on? Oh, okay, and very careful about spoilers. Um, a few of the panels will let you know this will be spoiler filled sure. and get ready for that. But in terms of if whatever level of fan you are, you just picked up Eye of the World and you're in love with it, come down. This is, there's pretty good sensitive stuff about that. I, my favorite uh, speaker at a panel was the 12 year old girl who was on her fourth reread of the series. She was bringing up plot points, character transitions, um, and it was, was com- pulling multiple adults over to her side of the argument um it, this was like in like an open q a yeah so yeah. like people are raising their hands and having a you know kind of round table discussion this 12 year old's become legendary at the con i've yeah. seen people talking about it <laughs> it's everywhere. amazing Tom I mean, she's been on panels yeah she's been on panels and like i just i just it blows my mind that she has that level of detail understanding at that age um, I, I thought it was so cool that um we so we talked to one of the organizers, who, and I was just like, who is that girl? She was super impressive. And he was like, um, I said her name, and he was like, yeah, I know her dad. He's like a super involved uh, volunteer. And, he, and we were like, can you pass him our info? I would love to do an interview with this 12-year-old girl <laughs> and her dad. And, <laughs> um, and I did like a short 15 minutes. Um, I just asked about them, and it was, it, it'll be a fun little clip to add to something. The audio is great. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, I think you put it best. You said when you heard her speak, if you just had the written transcript of what you said, you'd think like an adult said this goodness. thing. Yeah. Yeah. A very impressive, well, very intelligent adult. Constructed, well constructed arguments that, like, a lot of adults I know can't do that. Right, right. I guess that's what, that was my point. It's like, I wouldn't necessarily think she's an adult because I know a lot of adults who would fail at those basic tasks. Yeah. Yeah. So. But even then, all the panelists I've been with have been articulate Absolutely. and super passionate. Yeah. Um, no one feels like. It just feels like, it doesn't feel like a con, because no offense to other cons, but I've been to quite a few where at the end of the day, the feeling is more like, okay, we're tired, let's get out of here. People here just want to hang out. People here are just having fun, getting to know people. So Jordan Con has nailed the community vibe in a way I didn't think a con could do. Um, I 
can't think of another way to say this. I just I want to say like it's like a big family, but that's such a dumb cliche. That, <laughs> uh, but it, it really is. I, I'm, I, I, my family is not this close to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's I really like these not. People better than my family. Oh, way better. Way better. <laughs> Do your family listen to what talk now? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so uh, yeah, that's so enough gushing about that vibe. Have you guys been to? Have you had any favorite panels yet? Anything like that that you've really enjoyed? Any favorite highlights aspects of uh, the con? I mean, I'll say Team Jordan is always a delight. Yeah. Listening to Harriet and the rest of the team, which is people who worked with Robert Jordan and Harriet, to write the books, to, and and then again with Brandon Sanderson, they were his team to finish the books. And you know, basically, we'll never get to talk to Jordan. Mm. But that's as close as we're ever going to come to talking to the authors of the book. She was his editor. Yeah, she had she, a absolutely. huge influence over the series and still does. And yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And so, and uh, just listening to them talk. And I think someone was saying, it's not the stories they're telling you, it's the stories they're not telling you that really blow your mind. It's what's the sort of the love for Robert Jordan, the, um, you know... They just keep pulling new stories. Every time I hear them, they're telling new stories. Like, he seemed like such a fun and interesting, and everybody in his life loved him. Mm -hmm. You know, and that comes through as well, is that, like, Robert Jordan was loved. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so whenever I go to Team Jordan, I just, like, bask in the, like, the Jordan love. Um, <laughs> and then uh, costume contest is always fun. Yeah. yeah. Well, to clarify for people who don't know, Team Jordan is a panel where they have basically everyone who's still involved, still controls, correct, the Wheel of Time uh, property name. Everyone who's been involved from the beginning comes together and just talks Robert to the Jordan's to the con. Yeah. yeah, they go yeah. over the notes. You learn things that I unfortunately missed it, but you learn things that you just would not know otherwise. Right, um, which is truly remarkable. Um, I don't know. I'm 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 so sad I missed that. <laughs> I was at lunch and then time got away from me. That's fair. Um, yeah, that's fair. Um, I, it's how I was going to say you were going to say something. I cut you off earlier. Oh, I was just going going to say if I had to pick a favorite thing about this year is that last year and last year was our first the first year we ever came. It's my first year, their second. Um, and last year we just came as guests. This year we came like as official media and we sat on panels and it's just so cool. I mean, you're, this is your first year and you're doing that too. <laughs> yeah. But it's just it's so cool to be a part of it and I feel like that much closer to the organizers and um, this is just such a cool thing and. Maybe something interesting to bring up here is that a lot of people have been talking about with the show coming out, what's going to happen over the next two, three years to this con? Is yeah. it going to be Dragon Con? Yeah. Well, or with, you know, 60, 80,000 well, attendees. And, but, and those are the conversations that are going on in the background all the time. And to, to anyone listening who has any connection with Amazon, the general atmosphere is nervous, but very optimistic. Very optimistic. <laughs> Everyone has, I've yet to hear someone point at something and say they don't like that. Right. Um, I, the only the, the positive I pointed out that got a lot of people agreeing with me in, in one instance, and I, I kind of just randomly spewed it out without actually thinking it through, but luckily it worked out, you know, fortunately. <laughs> um, I do that a lot. I go by the skin of my teeth. But <laughs> Oh, so you're uh, familiar with the industry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Amazon seems very focused on the shows they're making. Yes. As opposed to, no offense, Netflix. Netflix, who seems to be throwing everything at the wall. Um, I like pretty much every step I've seen. It seems fan-grown, and that has resonated with the people here immensely. The fact that it seems fan-grown from the bottom up. Oh, it is. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know a ton about this, but uh, it's my understanding. Uh, don't, don't take my word for gospel. Jordan Con came from, it was a track at Dragon Con, and the organizers of that track were like, we want to take this and do our own thing. So it was really tiny in the beginning, and now it's like this year, I think, close to a thousand attendees, which yeah. is small for, you know, compared to, I'm comparing it to Dragon Con, which is giant. You know, but. Yes, it's small, but for a series that's never had an adaptation that's, you know, or had anything outside of just the books, right. I can't think of anything that has a convention like this. Um, I think maybe Dresden Files has something maybe going. Similar. Yeah. I can I'm see that. Sure. Yeah. yeah. It, that's a, a cult following yeah, yeah but you know no you know, shout out to dresden files absolutely they're awesome great books um but it's it's spectacular i hope they continue on i know someone mentioned maybe two different conventions in the future maybe just one bigger convention i don't know but with the solid groundwork here i'm just very optimistic mm -hmm. um when it comes to the show and everything obviously i could be wrong i'm willing to admit that <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things I, I think i tried to say during the panel and, and flubbed was i think we're a seed crystal 
and we're going to grow into a bigger crystal. Like, you immerse us in solution, and we're going to attract ion. Oh, we're just going to keep growing this awesome, cool structure. But we need that core of a thousand people to create the tone. Mm-hmm. And I think it's going to be important for us to keep that tone. Yeah. To be fair, we're all riding a wheel of time high right now. Yo, God, Very we're, I mean, so. <laughs> that's not the only high I'm riding. But yes. <laughs> yes, I am. Uh, and uh, that's that's been magnificent. So I, I'm, I'm incredibly optimistic I think growing growing has its negatives. We're gonna get more internet trolls. We're gonna get more people across the board that are going to be. That, that's how you know. Of course. My YouTube comment section versus the people here. There's a difference. There's Don't difference. be wrong. I love y'all, but I occasionally get people telling me they want to punch me in the face. That's a regularly occurring thing, um, and that will inevitably bleed into the wider picture. But I think what the foundation is strong enough that it could be filtered out. Um, gatekeeping does not seem to be a problem here. I don't think it will be. Um, and every time I see someone saying like, oh, well, it, Tom even mentioned earlier, not the character, there's a person, your name, Tom, that whenever yeah. the fan community has tried to say, oh, the people who haven't seen the show and not read the books, they're not going to, we don't want them here, they're they, that gets shut down here. Really fast. Really fast. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's fantastic. That being said, I've heard people say it. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> it's still it's, un- it's un- you know, because we certainly have a mentality, not we. Mm-hmm. But again, here's this thing. We, the people who are currently here at the con, versus they, the people who will be here, will in, the be here in the future. Right. And so it's this really nebulous they that, that gets talked about. But it's not, I don't think it's a negative. We, we're excited for you, they to become we. Yeah. It's not a Montague Capulet. You no. know what I mean? It, no. It's not, it's Great Bit in America now, not Great Bit in America 1800s. <laughs> well, maybe not now, maybe like three years ago. Okay, three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. I'm, I'm living in a bubble right now. Let me live. Yeah. <laughs> Are you expecting a much larger crowd next year? Do you think that'll be that think, instant? I don't no. think that's a show will be out yet. I, I agree. I think um, it's going to come out in 2020. I don't think it'll be out by April 2020. Okay. I think, but there may be some promotional material. My yeah, which will theory already is is that, um, and we were just talking to a guy downstairs who um, was telling us the um, numbers of registrations this year, and it, it looks like it's up of a ten-ish, maybe a little more than ten percent. Ten to fifteen. It was like yeah. eight hundred that you said this year. It was closer to nine hundred. And uh, like I said, my kind of pet theory is that as the hype on the internet with the show kind of uh, brings us up this. Uh, up the hype slope. Yeah, um, yeah people, growth. Yeah. People who read the series 10 years ago and were like, well, that was amazing. And then they just went on and read more books and they never went and looked for a fan community or anything yeah. because they didn't realize it existed. They're getting pulled back in. Yeah. And they're like, oh, the show's going to come out. And they pick up the books again and read them. And they're like, oh, Jordan Con, I didn't even know about that. Well, this is one of the top 10 selling fantasy series of all time. Right. Tens of millions of copies sold. There's a lot of people out there who read them, loved them, and moved on, exactly as you said. There's more than a thousand people who can come to this con. Exactly. Yeah. And they're going to be reminded. And I think the first time that trailer drops, even the first time a poster or a promotional drops, we will see... Because even right now, you, I'm sure you guys are aware how many people are surprised when they hear a show is coming. It's Most not. People. It's yeah. not. I even, mean, even folks who have read the books. A lot of people in that poll that Amazon did, if you looked in the comments, were saying, "There's a show for Wheel of Time," and I'm right. like, "Yeah, it got announced last year, man." <laughs> <laughs> but but what have you seen any promotional material that hasn't come out of um, us? No, no, and that's because well, I think. I think we, when we did that poll, definitely shook some stuff up. I've said this in videos before. I that agree. is something that will get noticed because Wheel of Time didn't just win some poll. It beat out Lord of the Rings. It beat out Good Omens, which already had a trailer. And it beat out The Expanse, which is already an established show. So this supposedly maybe side project at Amazon, that's going to get heard. Yep. That got heard the show, Lord of the Rings, they put how big is their budget for season one? It's crazy. It's, it's record setting. I have no idea. It's yeah. record setting. And that lost to a show that maybe not have decided the budget yet. Mm-hmm. So I, I heard, correct me if I'm wrong, but I heard uh, Amazon responded in a tweet or something. They, yeah, they did. They said, we heard you. Yeah, yeah. So, from the horse's mouth. <laughs> yes. That, and that's, that is, they are listening. And that's why we say, go support the artists. Amazon is listening. We can make a difference. And that's something that I've been told and heard so often from people at this con who know what they're talking about yeah is that amazon is paying attention to you folks. absolutely and that that stuff matters that these days we're just have, having we we're sitting on a panel uh, all of us together this morning um oh that was my favorite panel by the way that was really fun that was a <laughs> lot of fun was uh, it because you were on it yes <laughs> yeah absolutely um 
um, we're, we're talking to one of the organizers and he made this point that these days um, even really big massive companies like Amazon have to um, pay attention to some of the fandom like if you upset these people there you you are lose you're going to lose a lot of money mm-hmm. yeah and these are people who care and that gets them fired up so companies li- big companies like that listen now like if you hunt to Verantees back like I don't think Amazon really like, like cares to own all of all profits ever well, merchandise is a big deal. Merchandise, they, 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 they care, care. but they yeah. can do their own thing. They, yeah. they just don't have to. If people want to guarantee yeah. back, or they want those designs back, or whatever, they can absolutely maybe do some both. Deal can they be can say, "Okay, they're back," happy. and here's Amazon's merch. Right. Um, and I'm sure they'll make, set it up so they get a cut of everything because it's you know there's Amazon. They got muscle. Um, and uh, Sony. I keep saying it's Amazon. It's also Sony. It's equally Sony, from what I understand. I well, sure. Really they're they're the works. well. Amazon distributes. Sony produces. Okay, that's okay. the setup. All right. So, and then there's Red Eagle attached, but yeah. We hope they have nothing to do with it. I, I'm pretty sure it's a name on a contract. <laughs> it may also be a little bit of money. Okay. Just um, I, because there was a lot. Oh, yeah. There, there yeah. has to Bought be. out. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, good for you, Red Eagle. You get money even though you're doing nothing. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, they absolutely did something. They were capable of delaying the show long enough. You know, I think they knew that, that we needed TV to mature to be able to accommodate Wheel of Time. And so I think if the Wheel of Time had been made, you know, 10 years ago, we wouldn't have had the budget, the CGI, the graphics that really make it good, and we wouldn't have had Game of Thrones. So Red Eagle absolutely did us a huge favor by fucking over the fan community for like 10 years. They did a huge favor by absolutely messing with the fan community for like 10 years. Okay. Well, this transitions me into a topic I was actually really curious to get your guys' perspective of. Yeah. I don't know if you watch fantasy news. No hard feelings if you do not. It's, no. it's, it's something I do where I just cover all the stuff that's been going down. There's over 80 adaptations on the way. Different sci-fi and fantasy properties. 80 of them have been bought. That is an insane number. It's huge. It's something that's happened repeatedly with other genres. The westerns, there was one big western on TV, and then every TV channel had to have a western. But it's never happened on this scale, because there's never been so many content producers. Does it make you nervous? The fact that the audience will be split 80 ways. Or are you confident Will Time's going to stand out? It's going to be great and content's king. It'll be good enough that it'll just ride through. If it's good enough. Okay. I mean, I think that's a big if. That's one of the things that we worry about as fans waiting for this to come out. It has is to be a good show. It has, has to, to be a good show. Because but, there's a lot of other shows out there and I don't have time to watch them all. Oh, and, I don't. And yeah. it's going to be my job too soon. Yeah. I think, <laughs> I think the, I'm just relating right there. Uh, I think the, the Wheel of Time has a ton of potential as a series to really hit a lot of those like important hooks. Like first of all, diversity, yep. which is getting cool, and <laughs> people want to see that. And Wheel yep. of Time has an incredible amount of potential to you know. We talk about this kind of stuff all the time on the podcast. And I don't want to spend too much time speculating, but like you could make Moraine Asian. You could make, and we already have powerful female characters, no matter what color. It's a are. female-centric world. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had a great uh, Kirk. Uh, People had are going to like suggestion. That. He's from the Middle East, and he said, "Well, you know, the two rivers, Tigris and Euphrates, dark hair, olive skin." <laughs> we were out to dinner. I was like, "What? <laughs> the two <laughs> rivers? I never, why didn't I ever think of that?" Is the cradle of civilization. Yeah. And we should make those people look like the people from the cradle of civilization. Well, it, it fascinates me how often people don't realize how diverse Wheel of Time is. Yeah. I mean, Borderlanders are described as Asian. Lan is Asian-looking. That's how he's essentially described as a character. If you look at casting videos, half the time it's white, the other half the time it's Asian, and I'm like, all right, well, I know one piece, one group of these people know what they're talking about. Um, I like to say Samurai Batman. But, uh, <laughs> Samurai <laughs> Batman, yeah. all right. And if I would say, I would put um, Borderlanders as much more Japanese Asian and yeah. Kyrianen as much more Chinese Asian. Yeah. But it's not a one-to-one. No, it's not. And well, that's, I think, what people get hung up on is they say, hey, is our Kyrianans China? No. No. They have some things in common. The shape but they're also the head, they're they're pulling from Europe. They're yeah. pulling from Africa. They're pulling from the Middle mm-hmm. East. RJ took all of those fun qualities and just, like, mixed them up. He was essentially a blender for culture. Yeah. yeah. Just, okay, I love all these things. And or. Cool. All yeah. right. And again, I yield. Like, <laughs> and it worked really well being this cultural neutral thing where, okay, what makes sense for this world? Um, and I think Amazon can take that and run for a mile. Absolutely. Um, and that'll make it definitely stand out from a lot of the crowd. Because no hate for Witcher. I'm very excited for Witcher. I love it. But it's going to be Polish. And it's going to look Polish. Now, granted, they've done some diverse casting that it doesn't match the source material quite. And some people really hate that and freak out. 
and other people are like, yeah, that's cool, whatever. So you've already split. Wheel right. of Time's not going to have that problem. No. Because it doesn't, it's not going to split anybody because it's just how it is. You don't yeah. have to insert diversity into Wheel of Time. It already is diverse. Yeah. And that's because the author set out doing that. All that being said, I also want to add, Wheel of Time also has, like, blood, sex, incredible violence, big action scenes, like, all of the keystones of the of yeah. big, like, you know, giant battles and, like, all this epic stuff, that is also very important to, if you're trying to sell this thing. And someone brought up a point that I haven't heard very often, which is, Wheel of Time has an awful lot of horror elements in it. Everything yes, it with does. Pat and Fane, all the Trollocs. You the can actually, Murdral. The Murdral. You can hit... Oh, was that you, actually? Yes, that, that was me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the look of I, the eyeless is fear. I the line. Yeah. made comparisons to the way that Stephen King does horror. He tries. Robert Jordan tries to make you feel incredibly unsettled. He tries to put you in the feet of the people who are viewing this horrific stuff, and it reframes... Like, if you're following Lan and you're watching a battle, it's very cold. It's very, this is how it progresses. The people are fighting. But at the beginning, when Rand sees his first merge roll, he basically craps his pants. And that's how it should be. Um, and then as Rand matures and ages... By the way, I'm with the Wheel of Time spoilers, guys. So there's going to be spoilers. Also, if you don't follow them, go do it. Um, <laughs> Thank but, you. Yeah. Um, but I, I love that reframing, and I want to keep that horror element. Because it's another thing that can make it stand out. Absolutely. Game of Thrones has horror scenes, but I would say The Eye of the World is almost borderline fantasy horror. That first scene? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the, everything up through Shadow Logoth. Yeah. All the vegetation's dead, the yeah. weather's terrible, the like wind's whipping, and well, the world Rand turns around dying. and the yeah. <laughs> yeah. man with no eyes is staring at him, and he looks away and looks back, and he's gone. That's like, so, what a classic horror opening. Yeah. yeah. No, I would be expecting a jump scare right after that. Yeah, but there's not. There's not. <laughs> there's no cheap <laughs> but, jump scares. But what that means is Robert Jordan leaves you unsettled waiting for a, waiting exactly. for a jump scare. Because that's the problem with jump scares, they settle you. Yeah. You, you're like, oh, okay, there it is. Um, yeah. <laughs> yep. And but he just keeps amping up the tension, amping up the tension, amping up the tension until winter night, and Narg smart. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. and then and that's the relief of, and that's why it's so awesome when Tam pulls out the blade and like it, and actually fights and it blends get up. into traditional it, it, fantasy. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, it takes you out of that unsettled. I don't know where this is going. There's something weird going on. Why are we stuck in the two rivers? Yeah. and then Narg. Even meeting Moraine and Lan is mysterious. Yes, yeah. it's not Gandalf where it's this. You know, Gandalf is a little mysterious, but he was also welcoming, and he was Gandalf. he's an old friend. Know who yeah, he is. he's an old friend. Yeah. Where Moraine and Lan come in, and there's this almost like, are they evil? What's going on? These are these seem who brought these yeah. monsters. I yeah. love the misdirection towards Tom in the first couple of chapters <laughs> as like the evil guy bringing in the monsters because he shows up at the same time and yeah. he's like he's not there. Like no one saw him during the battle. That first night, when the in the two rivers, but his cloak was cinched. Yeah, and this is this moment was like, wait, what was he doing? Yeah, well, he's just helping people, you know. Like, but there is that little bit of misdirection where you're like, well, did was he was he bringing the trollocs in? You would think <laughs> it's one of the people, the new people we just met. Exactly. It's not. Yeah. Well, you know, R.J. It's I, that, I just friend. that was weird. Don't call Robert Jordan R.J. Robert Jordan uh, didn't spoon feed the reader at the beginning. Never. No. And I think that's one of the turnoffs for some people. A lot of people are used to being spoon-fed answers. Yep. And his mentality, at least for the first third of the series, was figure it out. Um, and there's, you know, there's exposition. Obviously, there has to be. But it's never to the point of, here's A, B, C, D. He'll go, here's, here's A, here's D, here's F. And you're going to get the next fill-in in book six, seven, eight. Yeah. <laughs> and you can't connect A to F until you get C, which is not coming for a couple of years. Yeah. Which um, I get can be off-putting. It can. But be. I think once you finish, you start rereading. You finally appreciate. I Jesus like Christ. that about him too. If you read some of his old Q and A sessions, there's a lot of oh, it's in there. Yeah, <laughs> you just need to look harder. Like, it's like you know, <laughs> Raffo. That's, yeah. that's basically what Raffo is: is yeah. read and go find out. Like yeah. the, I think it's missing the go. Like, but that's what he's saying. You go find it out. Yeah. Right. Like I'm not going to tell you. I saw a very cryptic thing, and I'm not sure if it was from Jordan or Sanderson. Where he essentially said there is a huge secret in the series he's never seen anyone online bring up. That at was all. a Sanderson thing. It's a Sanderson yeah, thing. Yeah, and I'm a little skeptical. Of I'm a little skeptical about that. I, but I, I am looking for it. Okay. Yeah. I, chapter by chapter, in seven years, we're going to track that son of a bitch down. <laughs> and if we don't find it, Somewhere. coming after Sanderson. <laughs> for, 
putting me on this track. No. <laughs> for those of you looking for it, they do chapter by chapter spoiler filled for the whole series analysis of the chapters. It's wonderful if you finish the series and if you're doing your reread or if you've done your 10th reread. I'm going to keep plugging you guys because I love your content. Thank you. Um, yeah. So seriously, go check them out. If you don't. We plug your content, but we're on your channel. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> check me out. Um, <laughs> like and subscribe. So... We just heap praise and praise. So I want to get on a more t controversial thing for Wheel of Time that's been brought up at multiple panels here, and that's the romances within Wheel of Time. They, they range the spectrum. Sure. There, there are great healthy romances, and there are horrible abusive romances in Wheel of Time. There are like in real life. Yeah, yeah, there are there are romances that all fans love, and there's romances that some fans really don't love. Um, do you guys Very have any? Diplomatic of you. How do you feel? Yeah, that's, yeah. I'm trying to be <laughs> diplomatic, despite what I just said about Red Eagle. <laughs> I don't think we have to be diplomatic about Red Eagle. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when it comes to the rep, you know, the the love square, something the triangles, love square. There's, right. there's there's all of that happening. Uh, do you want them to just copy those relationships over, or do you think some of them need to be updated? Excuse me, changed. How would you translate the wheel? Times relationships to the to the silver screen. So here's my opinion. Five years ago, I would have said the relationships suck. Really, I, w I would have said he doesn't do a good job of setting them up. You never see the people interact, and then suddenly they're in love, and I don't get it. Today, I'd say they're some of the most brilliantly written love stories I've ever read in my life. Well, because they're young love, so that happens like that, that. does. Yeah. But yeah. also, he's so subtle. Yeah, and I missed a lot of the interactions that were leading to the relationship in my younger days that now as I'm older I'm like oh no Lana and Naive are flirting there yeah and I didn't see that the first few times I read the book because I was terrible at flirting because once again he's not spoon feeding you yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah. and so a lot of people are like these relationships come out of nowhere and I don't like them and I'm like then you need to read closer there's yeah. a lot of subtlety well even the early interactions with Brandon and Egwene it feels it now in hindsight as an adult who's experienced more it does feel like a people kind of falling out of it. Like, Absolutely. Because, like, the whole... I mean, there's a great scene with uh, Perrin, Matt, Rand, Egwene when they're united, and uh, someone brings up Min, and Egwene's kind of curious, and then Perrin brings up Aram in retaliation. It's a very funny scene. Uh, for those of you who are hearing rustling... Uh, Sorry about that. <laughs> Seth, Seth, I'm is cold. Put, Seth is putting on his Gleeman cloak, so oh. it's very acceptable. Um, and... It's a funny scene. It's played for comedy, but it's never really brought up again. There's no real longer jealousy. There's Because if you were those kids who were that into each other... There'd be jealousy. There'd be all kinds of stuff. It's early warning signs of maybe they're just kind of not... I don't think they were ever into each other. I think maybe Egwene had a slight childhood crush on Rand, and mm -hmm. then it became an expectation. Because right. they are the best of the two rivers. And so what happens when you have your two best people? Well, of course you're going to assume they're going to get together. Yeah. But they, I don't think they were ever in love. A friend of mine, uh, Murphy Napier, a great booktuber, check her out if you have not. She's, I'm, she's going through the series for the first time. And she is massively speculating. She's not listening because I did spoil the warning. She's massively speculating that uh, Perrin and Egwene are going to end up together. Because they spend this huge chunk of time together in Eye of the World. And she gets this vibe that like Perrin's kind of into Egwene. And there's little signs of maybe that early I ship on. it. Yeah. I should, yeah. I, actually, well, I mean, if you go back and listen to those episodes, I'm all about it. I'm like, when we were covering those sections of, of um, Perrin and Egwene uh, hanging out with um, Elias. Elias, I'm just like, this would be a way better relationship than either of Anything theirs. Wayne did. <laughs> yeah, I think Wayne did. Or even, I mean, we can argue about the parent one. But yeah. I would say that Fayil and Egwene have an awful lot of characteristics in common. Very stubborn, very intelligent, very driven. Yeah, very... I could see it. And like yeah. Daniel said earlier, it's, it's a young... These are two really young kids. It wouldn't be terribly surprising to, you know, you're in this stressful situation together and all that, and they're two attractive people. Like, yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. And you know? they go through the typical <laughs> falling in love thing where Perrin rescues her yep. and all this. And well, she rescues awesome. him, really. Well, well that's, that's the Wheel of Time thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> where, where he stumbles out of the river all drowned rat. I'm going to help her. And she's like, would you like have, to, like, have a seat by the fire I built? <laughs> <laughs> with all the supplies that Bella brought over for me? I'm fine. Please have a seat. You're like, I'm rescuing you. Help me. <laughs> well, there's, there's, um, there's spectacular little things where the friendships have depth. You know, there is a little bit of romance between Perrin and Egwene at times. There is a little bit of, uh, even Matt. I've always got the feeling that Matt, even during his womanizing phases and things like that, he's definitely not as bad as a lot of, he, he tries to make himself come across worse than he is. That, that <laughs> is a good point I think a lot of people miss. Matt, says he's worse than he is, and the girls say he's worse than he is. Right. And it's this compounding effect where you're like, oh, Matt's such a scoundrel. It's like, 
So he likes to represent himself that way. Yeah. Dude, I get he, it. He likes to kiss some girls at a bar every once in a while. But it's like, never so like you. Kissing <laughs> girls at bars. Who likes that? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's uh, never like he's waking up in a bed with like a tavern maid he took upstairs drunk. That's never a never thing. Never a thing. And, and, and it's stated several times that he's only interested in girls who are interested in him. Yeah. And that's and he, he likes him plump. That's, yeah. that's well, said sure. repeatedly. <laughs> we all have preferences. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, well, um, and I love that Tuan is the opposite of everything he thinks he likes. That happens in real life a lot. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. well, you might like one thing when you're dating and something, and you end up falling in love with was, something that you never dated before. I always really loved that relationship because I see them as so very different people. Tuan, I see as like a very kind of stiff, organized, like highly trained person, and Matt's like, let's fuck it, let's wing it. <laughs> <laughs> but they're they're I mean both super successful at, at what they do, and um, Tuan tells Matt that. He reminds her of her dad, yeah, who was a, also a general. Some girls have their preferences. <laughs> <laughs> what, something that I, I so I will admit, I didn't love Matt and Two on the first time through. I didn't love Matt and Two on my fifth time through. It's and, a hard relationship to like. Yeah, and I still don't think it's my favorite, and there still have a lot of issues with it. Yeah, uh, mainly because Two on is not a nice person. No. She's really not, and it's not even a culture thing. Like the Aiel often come across as jerks when they're actually right because their culture is very jarring. Tuan and the Shan Jin in general are just jerks. Uh, I'm using that word, and I want to use worse words. Uh, and, you know, they endorse slavery, things yeah. like that. And that, that makes me almost be like, I don't want Matt with this person, because in her mind, like, you know, slavery's fine. Um, so there's, there's little things that I, I can't get over, but the more people have opened to me, like, okay, they're so different, it's opposites attracting, you got to understand that. The more I'm like, all right, I get that, I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. But I'm still never sitting there gushing, like, oh, they're just so cute. Like, well, and, and I will say, part of it is... Uh, what I love about the relationship is they didn't fall in love. That's not why they got together. So you don't think Matt loves her at the end? Let me rephrase that. They were both given prophecies that said, you will marry this person. Yeah. It's almost like a destiny arranged <laughs> It was a marriage. destiny. It was an arranged marriage by fate. Mm-hmm. Because both of them, it said, you will marry this person, you will marry that person. And they were looking, they saw each other, and like, Gross. Uh, <laughs> oh, shit. Can I buy you? <laughs> well, Matt, Toy? Matt, uh, Matt thought Tuan was a child yeah. when he first met her because she has that kind of build. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, so he at least was like, all right, at least it's years off. Good. I got, I got time. <laughs> and he never, ever considered her as a partner until he realized she was the daughter of the Nine Moons. Yeah. Whereas all of the other girls, he was with them, and then he asked if they were the daughter of the Nine Moons. Yeah. And so his, his, he never saw her as a romantic partner until he learned he was going to marry her. And Matt went some through traumatic things right before he got with her that may have reframed him and more prepared him for that. Oh, um, that's, yes, that's, but yes. That's I one mean, of the few totally. things I want reframed from the books because in the books it is played for jokes at times. Yes. That is what is done to Matt there, and it shouldn't be. I agree. Um, that's, you know, and that's something that time has just changed, how it we has. do things like that. Um, I know there's inevitably people in the comments section who will say, he was into it, he wanted it. I disagree. <laughs> Reverse the genders on that statement. Yeah. Yep. That's all you need to say there. Uh, but no, it's, and that's again, like something where I, I think, yes, it was played for jokes, but it's still Jordan new. So that's still traumatic and it's yes. still going to change how Matt is approaching all these things. Um, and even then later on, you see Matt saying like he wants to go womanize, but he never does. He never goes to bars again with the, the, rant, red, uh, the band of the red hand and picks up, you know, women and like that. In fairness, he does check out some women for Talmanis. Yeah. Yeah. It's totally. No, for... totally for Talmanis. <laughs> it's not because he's checking them out at all. Yeah. But every married man in the world still does that. Fair. <laughs> um, so, Say three unmarried men. So uh, moving on from that romance, the one I really wanted to get the meat into, uh, would you keep the love square? Yeah. Good. I think, it's, I think it's a critical part of the story. I think it's something he wrote in there for a purpose. I think it uh, reflects a lot of Rand's characteristics and who he is and makes him, is part of why he's a bigger than life character. Patrick? Yes. I mean... Three of the women. Yeah. Oh, they're amazing characters. And and the and the three women, it, uh, the three women and we're, trope is such we're talking a about the square thing. with uh, the Tom Morgan. No, that's a pentagram. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're talking about Rand, Elaine, Avienda, uh, uh, men. men thank oh, you. okay. That's um, the one square. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, if we're going to represent everybody, we need to get our poly people in here too, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> that's the people like we. Oh, multiple relationships. That's disgusting. Like. My poly people, stand up! Like, <laughs> yeah, it's not a problem if everyone's acknowledged and informed and aware, which they all are. And I don't like when people say that it's 
a harem. To me, that's not accurate no. what's happening. It's an open relationship. If it was a harem, he would decide when he, who he slept with. He doesn't. Yeah. Or they do. Well, yeah. Avienda harem very much like so ownership. is like, by the way, we're doing this now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Rand is willing, but it's very much so Avienda's choice. And he says, I'm never going to get to pick which one of you I see, am I? Yeah. And she's like, nope. No. No. They choose. We choose. And, yeah. and so you can't. Yeah have show preference basically and yeah. like show show favoritism i think yeah. i mean that takes away that complication out of the relationship like, yeah. Yeah. just okay just tell me what to do cool yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well there's there's the follow-up question if you had to remove one character from the equation who would you move remove rand <laughs> <laughs> okay from a realistic they're adapting the books to the tv show you have to keep rand he's the chosen one he's the center of the series make it a line <laughs> <laughs> make Elaine the Dragon Reborn. Yeah. Or, okay. uh, sorry, Egwene. Make Egwene. Egwene. Make Egwene okay. Dragon Reborn. Ooh. Eliminate Rand. You just, all together. by the way, there's like 80 comments that have happened in the last three seconds. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that your serious final answer? That is my, so I would not, like, I do not think we should remove one of the girls. Like, I, I think it's a terrible mistake. People say that Min is stupid or, uh, no, they are critical characters. They are main characters. And I think you change, fundamentally change the story by removing one. As opposed to removing Rand. I think he is such an everybody that you can replace him with any other character. Interesting. He okay. he is the blank slate that we project ourselves onto, at least in the beginning. Okay. When he becomes less of a main character and we see him through the eyes of other characters, he goes on and changes. Okay. In the beginning, he's a blank slate. Okay. And so any character can take his place. Do you have the same opinion, Patrick? Uh, no. Okay. Um, <laughs> This is a really hard question, though. I love the series so much, I don't want to remove anything from it. Um, but if I have to, I have to pick a mainish character or a main character. Um, gosh, can I? I'm, I'm just going to take another minute on this. That's uh, fine. That's fine. I think the easy answer from my perspective is Avienda, but I think people are forgetting how much of an amazing introduction she is to the Aiel culture, which, mm-hmm. again, the rest of the series falls back onto for. The until the end, absolutely. Um, so I think taking her out is a lot trickier than a lot of people think. Yep. Um, I think Elaine, she has her own plot lines, her own continuation of everything. Andor relies on her. I guess the easy solution would be switch it over to Rand, but you know, make Rand be the king of Andor from earlier on. But I think that would take mm-hmm. a lot away. And then removing Men, you essentially remove the one healthy relationship that's not Aiel based in the series that is continual and not broken up by drama. I mean, Rand and Men are the only two that are together drama free for the most part except for things that are done to them um, and represent like a people can just enjoy their relationship mm-hmm. uh, men I think would be the hardest to pull out that's just my perspective on it um. yeah I, I I think maybe from a plot wise standpoint you might say well she doesn't do much except figure out how to how to like you could you could keep Harold fell alive and right. replace a lot of what that's she quote unquote does I love men but I see I see how you could how how you could take that out from a plot point perspective? She doesn't have She's, a lot of hooks in the okay. plot other than Rand. Visions and research could be attributed to like the Aes Sedai that he's surrounded with, or you know we could make Elaine more of a scholar or something. Who doesn't trust Aes Sedai? That was brought up at a <laughs> yeah. panel earlier. Someone mentioned removing uh-huh. the men. Yeah. I'm coming loaded. I previously had this conversation. No, I, <laughs> I, I, I agree. I, yeah. and, and I would say um, for me, if you remove men, yeah. Rand's decision at the end based on love and his coming back down. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make, make sense. sense. It makes no sense. Because that's based yeah. off yeah. men largely yeah. in the development yeah. he goes through with her. No, and, and that's where, like, if you talk about events, men is easy to remove. If you talk about the way people feel, think, act, she's impossible. I, she's my favorite. If I had to pick one of the three girls to date, it would be men. <laughs> <laughs> All right. that's that's. I, I go off the end of it. I'm mm-hmm. partial to strong women with red hair. Sure. <laughs> as, Fair enough. As am I. Um, but one thing I'll say is, like, the women represent the three aspects of Rand, mm-hmm. right? And I've said this a million times on our podcast, but uh, Elaine is the Andor king, mm-hmm. part of Rand. Min is the two rivers... Uh, local boy home. and home and Avienda is his inheritance and they are all different aspects of his personality and what makes him him and each part of him loves those women for different reasons for different reasons yeah. and, and yeah. I think he needs that do you buy into the theory that Elaine and Avienda were having a relationship because they wake up in the same bed at times they, they casually you, you think yes, they're together I do yeah I, I believe that was put there as well but Robert Jordan never goes into detail about those things no. so I when Robert Jordan, when it comes to sex and things like that, when he gives you an inch, I think you have to assume a yard. Yes. I yeah. think in general. Um, that's why there, I think there is a lot more 
unconsensual things in Wheel of Time that we're allowed to unbelieve because he doesn't want to put that in there explicitly. So when we're just kind of lightly hinted, we need to, okay, yeah, there's a lot more there we didn't get into. There's a couple of obvious involving horrible shadow things. Um, but yeah, when the Shido, things like that. And it's implied that most, not most, but some, or good, I don't even know how to use a, a adjective, a percentage of First Sisters are in a relationship yeah. and a percentage are not. not. And pillow friends. And pillow yeah. friends. Well, which is not a term that I, uh, I yield use. No. Oh. That's purely a White Tower thing. Oh, right. I'm just saying these, these relationships exist. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Those, yeah. yeah. Well, there's a whole lot of LBGTQ stuff that is hinted at. Yes. <laughs> it's really glazed over. Yeah. Um, which some people like because they're like, oh, it's not made a character like, they're not all that. They are their own characters and mm-hmm. some people don't like because they want it more to the forefront. And neither one's wrong. It's just two perspectives. Yeah. And it's one of those things that's all about how you want to interpret it. Like, you could... You, you could say you, you don't actually see it, so maybe it never happened. And also, you know, you can say, like, good friends might sleep in a bed next to each other, and that doesn't mean that they had sex. Yeah. But... But when one's the queen, <laughs> it's kind of like, they're not sharing a bed to save on hotel room rent. <laughs> you know? Like, there's plenty of beds. That's yeah. a good point. Like, so, uh, Patrick, you're not escaping, though. So if you had to remove one of the three women... God damn it. <laughs> you're not escaping. <laughs> one of the three. Yeah. Who are three of the best characters in Wheel of Elaine. Time? Probably Elaine. Elaine. Okay, that's in terms of Rand, probably the easiest one because she is, you know, the early kind of giddy crush and moving on from there. But it's not, and you could have him have a crush on her early yeah. on and yeah. then never have it go anywhere. Yeah, you know? interesting. Okay, so I'm, I got it out of you. Sorry, I had to pull no, a tooth there. I am no, it's okay, and I hate to say it, <laughs> but um, uh, she's the one I like the least. Okay, like a story wise or character wise. Both. <laughs> ah, interesting. All right. Okay, I mean, Elaine is there at a lot of key events, but I, I guess more, it's more of her personality. I just don't really like her as a person. I like. It's a, not that she's not useful yeah. or you know whatever. It's just I don't really relate. I don't like yeah. her very much. I, I don't like, like Sanderson's Elaine. I really like Jordan's Elaine. Yeah. Okay. That well, that's there is a difference there. It's yeah. Elaine and Matt that stand out the most different yeah. to me. Um, now, it's interesting to me that uh, I like Elaine, but I love the people around her. Yes. Like, Brigida is one of my favorite characters right. in Forever oh, Will heck Be. yeah. Yeah. And I, I never cut Brigida. <laughs> <laughs> never. Well, no. Yeah. Um, but there's two characters that I, I, I would rest my hat on defending until the end of the time that they need to be in there that might get cut. They're in the possibility would be Tom and Brigida. Uh, I think they're both crucial to the series in terms of heart development. Brigida is crucial in terms of lore and built wider world building. Uh, I just, I think people are too cut... Uh, People are too interested in cutting char- main characters. Well, Rafe already said he's not going to. Yeah. He tweeted out, there's no main characters will be cut. I didn't know that. And, like, that's great because, yeah, you're going to cut scenes. Mm. You're going to cut plot points. You're going to cut a lot of minor characters. But why are you talking about retooling the main relationships of the series? Well, like, I, that I like just sense. having fun conversations. Okay, well, fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. But, but I have, like, I've had this argument with people that, like, this has to be cut. We're going to have to get rid of so many of these main it's characters. And it's I'm like, this no. intricate woven net, and if you pull a thread out, I'm using an obvious analogy. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, it's so hard to put it back together and make it work again. Like, if you cut Elaine, who, where is Bernita? Yeah. Like, how does she How does she be in this? She can't follow on with Nynaeve, because Nynaeve and her don't, yeah, that, that, that wouldn't yeah. work. Um, yeah, the dynamic there, you need that third person to be the outside reason voice. Um, you guys were here a year before me. Do you notice any differences already between that year and this year, aside from just the growth? Does there seem to be more excitement, more... I wouldn't say that. One of the things that was different last year is Brandon was here, okay. and he had just released Oathbringer. Oh, I'm, I'm kind of glad you brought that up because um, we were talking about growth and um, when we were talking to that gentleman earlier who was telling us the numbers, um, it got brought up that, well, Brandon Sanderson was here last year. Yeah. So, so they're bigger. People who had never read yeah. The Wheel of Time came anyway. Like, I would say at least half the people who were here last year, like, were less familiar with Wheel of Time than they were with Brandon Sanderson. It wow. was a lot. I don't know if it was half, but it was, I it was, was a lot. I was surprised. Okay. Um, a large, piece, a large, large percentage of the Cosmere showed up. A large percentage of the percentage of Cosmere showed up last year and a lot of the costumes were Cosmere based um, more so than this year. Which I think people encouraged. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, yeah. clearly Sanderson worked on the, the Wheel of Time. Crossover. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's perfect. It's in, you know, even this year, a lot of the costumes were, were Sanderson yeah. costumes. So clearly the fan base is going to overlap because he finished the series. And Brandon's influence from Jordan is huge. Huge. They, they read the same. 
Uh, not the same. They, they they read in style in an incredibly similar way. Not um, so that that's there. So, but what I think the point Patrick is trying to make is that they're bigger this year, even though Brandon's not here. And yeah. before every year, Brandon comes as the record breaking year. Yeah. But this year without Brandon is the record breaking year. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so imagine if he was back. <laughs> yeah. A lot more Cosmere. Yeah. And so I think that changed the tone a little bit because the tone last year was like really excited about Brandon, really excited about Oathbringer. Not that I don't love what Brent Weeks does, but there's just not the same. No, I've honestly not had a conversation with anyone about Brent Weeks here until I, this. I also want to say that uh, Jordan Con made me aware of Brent Weeks. I had never yeah. read any yeah. of his stuff before. I highly so recommend now you I'll do. probably turn around and read some at some yeah. point. Oh, I've, yeah, I've read all his stuff. Yeah. 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 Lightbringer is well worth the read. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's he talked about his whole introducing of light as a magic system, and I didn't really appreciate how much scientific basis there was in that. Which is weird that he did that because that really echoes what Brandon does for his yeah. magic systems. Um, but yeah, it was cool to see someone else who's putting that much time, mm-hmm. thought, and effort into a magic system that panned out really, really well. Yeah, I, I do. F- I don't think it's as perfect of a magic system as I would add some of the things that Brandon comes up with. Well, Brandon's meticulous. Yeah, uh, to a, to a great extent. Yes, and pans yes, out. Yes, um, I'm really good at inventing magic systems. Did you see the the page of notes that were released of like his plan and all the like different magic systems he's been inspired recently by? Like, he was looking at like baseball pitchers, and he was like, "I want to do something where people are hurling magic the way they do." And it's like very. Like, it was just amazing to see this guy who's clearly just watching baseball, and his mind goes, "I can make a match out of that." <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much what I wanted to end it on. So Jordan Khan's been wonderful. If you are a Robert Jordan and or Cosmere fan, be sure to check it out in the future. Be sure to check out the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. These guys know what they're talking about. Despite Seth saying he wants to re- uh, remove Rand from the relationships. <laughs> I'm me. just saying, you, you forced me to pick one. Okay. And you did not sp- specify. <laughs> Um, it has to be one of the females. Be sure to check it out. Jordan Con is an incredible, diverse, fun, family-feeling convention that will not overwhelm you. And I hope to see more of you here in the future. And I need to get to editing this so I can make it to the dance party tonight. So I hope you guys are having a fantastic weekend. And I hope I get to meet even more of you. Thank you so much for Thank having you. us, Daniel. Absolutely.